<laughs> Why study this? Okay, that's really the first question people always have. You know, Jesus died. We've cooked, cleaned up. You know, Jesus doesn't look all beaten, bruised. Like he's got a little glow about him. You know. And, uh, and here, here's this is the Jesus who's really quite interesting. He looks almost, you know, you've got to love the art of it, but almost like he's. I don't know, not even interested. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? But what I really want to ask you so, and put, put yourself in a position now, if you were standing in front of the cross 2,000 years ago, and you looked up at Jesus on the cross, what would be the observations you would have? How would it affect you? What would you come home with? Well, the first thing I have to point out to you is there was nothing about it that even remotely looked like a sacrifice. It was a god-awful, bloody, murderous mess. It was horrible. Christians didn't even use the word, the cross, okay? It was a scandal. St. Paul says that early Christians viewed it as both scandal and shame. So, in fact, the enemies of the church, many of the people refused to accept uh, the, the, the fact that our Lord God came in the flesh and died for us because his death was so horrific. It's not like he got stoned to death. This was a horrific death. So for, for many people, they found it very difficult to believe that God who would come in the flesh would allow himself to be so brutally murdered. So we have to understand the insanity of this whole thing and the fact of the scandal and the shame of it. The first point is this. You know, we're reminded, as Paul tells us, now listen, and the Greeks are always looking for wisdom, and the Christ, uh, you know, is the stumbling block here. You know, and, and, this, and to the Jews, he's absolute. This is just this is just crazy talk. That God, who would come outside of time and space into this world, would then come into this position of being crucified. And so Paul has to remind them, maybe you guys are, but I am not ashamed of this gospel. So I show you what? What's this? <laughs> this would be the modern equivalent, wouldn't you? Dude, would you walk into your church and see this? No. No? Or this? Would you walk around with jewelry? How many people have a cross around? It, huh? <laughs> huh? Would you have this about your neck? No. Or what about this? Pictures in your home of Jesus electrocuted. Would you do it? Yeah. <laughs> or the guillotine. Let's get in with France, right? The guillotine. <coughs> or that around your neck. Beautiful jewelry, or, or death by lethal injection, right? See, jewelry, huh? Is it purpose? I want you to let that set a little bit. Looky here, we've got mockery. There's a museum in Israel. That this is here. Woo, woo, museum in Israel. Mockery, mockery. And they won't refuse. They refuse to remove it. Yet to a Christian, this is just. But as you see going forward, how painful this is for. What symbol, then, if they didn't use the cross, did the Christians use? And most people here would say, uh, probably the fish. The fish, you know. <laughs> why is that? Just as a FYI, people always ask, well, why the fish? So I, I explain it. The Greek word for, for fish in Greek is ekthos. And at most of the time in the early church, we used to use acronyms for everything. So, isos, Christos, theos, theos, the salter, ekthos, okay? Jesus Christ, all right? God's son is the Savior. Okay, we'll translate it that way for you. Make it easy. So the other thing about this is very interesting. See this mark and this one? So if you were, if I was talking to you, and I wanted to know if you're a Christian, is it safe to really share with you? Then as we were talking, I could make a mark in the ground like this, make that art. You know, if you weren't a Christian, you'd think, this guy's sort of a nervous nilly, but you, know, you wouldn't think much of it. But if you were a Christian, you'd recognize, well, it seems to be safe. You would finish that fish. And hence, it would be a place where you could talk openly about Christ. So it had value. And of course, if the Romans saw it, they just thought, remember, Pisces, about the fish. The Roman soldiers would think, oh, that was Pisces. Oh, so it was Pisces crowd. So but the real question going forward isn't about, it, it's really that issue, why has anybody got to die? What is all this death about? What are you Christians hung up on this death? In fact, you know that, that Christopher Hitchens, you know, the, uh, the atheist, he says, I don't know what sort of God you guys got. But he murders his own son. That's what you believe? Wow. Or there are actually theologians out there who say, 
God is guilty of a, a sort of cosmic child abuse. <laughs> serious charges. Very serious charges. These are Christian sins. So we have to get at because I, I would claim, and I will show you, that they're missing the mark entirely of what this is all about. So the question you have to ask yourself is, this is the worst of all deaths. I mean, we're not talking a mild death here. This is a horrific death. Why? So let's remember this first principle tonight, the gift of self. Greater love has no man than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. Second, no one takes it from me. I lay it down on my own. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. Get that? Jesus is no wussy little victim here. He's no little character who doesn't know what's going to happen. He, as we heard tonight, is in charge. He's orchestrating this. He is himself determining the way he wants to give this gift back to the Father. The Father gives him the command, I need you to save humanity. The Son has to determine with the Father how to do this. And this is what we're going to see played out. The way we came to know love, catch this, is that we, he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for each other. Hmm. Interesting, can we read? We skipped that. We like to pass those things up. <laughs> Sacrifice. Now, if you were standing at Calvary, if you watch this going on, would anybody say, there's Jesus' sacrifice for my sins? Would anybody say that? No. no. There's no way in this planet anybody could come up with that statement. Even the apostles bolted. There's no way they could grasp that. So, this was a play out, flat out murder. You can Maybe you can stretch it to a, a martyr's death. But come on, a sacrifice for the forgiveness of humanity's sins? There's no way you're going there. Not without the power of the Holy Spirit later to help us. So to understand Good Friday, the first place we have to go where? Good Friday, crucifixion. You want to understand it? Where do you go? Holy Thursday. Holy Thursday, that's right. You've got to rewind the tape. Because remember, the context of the crucifixion of Jesus is very clear in the Jewish mindset. It is the Passover. I earnestly desire to eat this Passover with you as we're all being. We must understand this Passover if we're going to understand the crucifixion. Otherwise, it makes no sense. It's just a murder. So there is, we've talked about this before, some of us, the, the Toda. The Toda is a type of Old Testament sacrifice. It is considered the highest of all sacrifices. The Toda sacrifice is a sacrifice of where blood, where wine and bread are consecrated by the priest. The lamb is consecrated. It's celebration and thanksgiving for some great thing. So, for example, your child is healed. You take it to the temple. You have these gifts of consecration. You bring them back home. You're so elated that, and so filled with joy that you pour yourself into. These consecrated gifts represent the individual poured into this. It's a part of you. And so what happens with the total sacrifices, then you invite your family and friends to share with you the bread, share with you the wine, share with you the lamb, and in so doing, sacrifice and praise God while you sing the Toda Psalms. This is the most holy of all the Jewish holidays, is the Passover. The Passover is a type of Toda. This is where the Catholic Church gets the understanding that the Eucharist, which is the Greek word for Thanksgiving. Okay, you understand where that's coming from. So you're starting to make connections. So we celebrate, and the first thing we have to ask ourselves to a Jew, what does the Passover represent? And the answer is, it represents coming from slavery, out of slavery, to freedom and new life, right? To the Jew. And the Jews believe this concept, that every Jew that has ever lived or will live was present at that exodus. Because that event was outside of time and space for all Jews to access. So it wasn't just the Jews of that time, but Jews today are still part of the Passover, part of that original event because that event takes place outside of time and space and a concept in Judaism that's called memorial. The memorial, which should start a little familiar for those of us that are Catholic, <coughs> because the memorial of, of, which we'll get to in a minute here. So the memorial is a concept, is an understanding that God is outside of time and space. Right? So 
This event is something that every person, every in humanity, can lay hold of and make their own, no matter what age you live in. So your great-great-grandchildren are now a part of this memorial, if you're a Jew at the Passover, if you're early Christian at the Christian Passover, if you're a Christian at the cross. Right. This memorial means it is very individual, it is very personal. Is very personal. So, this important context is reminded by the, the notion of four cups. Anybody remember that notion of four cups we talked about? The ancient Passover feast celebrated four cups of wine, right? Four cups. So, let's just do a quick, you know, cliff notes. At the Last Supper, the third cup is drunk. This is called the cup of blessing, Barakah. The fourth cup is not drunk. The songs are sung. The great Hillel. And then there should be the fourth cup, but it's not. And says, scripture says he went off into the night. He skipped the fourth cup. Which is like akin to saying what? A joke without a punchline. It doesn't make any sense. And the, and the apostles were baffled. What, what, what is he talking about? I, mean, I understand the third cup the cup of blessing, but this fourth cup was omitted. It was called the cup of consummation. And just to fast forward, so we have the third cup here. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. The third cup, re Jesus reconstitutes. He's deviated from the ancient Passover formula. Why? Because it was the old covenant. A new covenant's coming to play. The old covenant was the, the dead lamb, and you paint the, uh, the blood on the doorpost, right? Remember that from the Old Testament? So in the New Testament, the new lamb, the new covenant. And it's going to be not a lamb, but it's going to be Jesus himself. So we see the forerunners, which will be shed for you. You see, he's warning them, fourth cup's coming, and it's going to be shed for you. This third cup... We see in Paul, it's called the cup of blessings. You ever notice in, in Corinthians 10? He was angry at the people in Corinthians Corinth because they showed up at Mass. They were getting drunk on communion wine, for heaven's sake. Sounds a little bit... Well, St. Hillary's not quite that bad. <laughs> so, as bad as you think it's giddy, it's never quite that bad. So, if it's possible, Father, let this... Now, this is a statement from the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. If it's possible, what? Let this cup pass from me. So, our Lord is warning ahead of time that, hey, listen, this fourth cup is a doozy. This one's a doozy. All right, so yeah, I thirst, and then from the cross, so cliff notes, final analysis on the test question. I thirst. Remember on the cross he said that? What did they give him? They gave him rancid wine. Catch that? And it was on a hyssop branch they dipped it in, which hyssop branch in the Old Testament is what you painted the blood on the doorpost with in the old way. So Jesus is the hyssop branch. So John points these things out to you. It is an early Christian you catch them. Certainly as a Jewish Christian, you catch it very quickly. Very strong significance. Remember, Passover was to the Jew kind of what July 4th is to, to an American. I mean, you know it. You need to know it. And so they understood these little details. So we can move now that the context is clearly Jesus Christ fulfilling this total sacrifice in himself as both the priest and the victim. Key here, this is the means by which we unite ourselves and our lives and our sufferings to God. That's the thesis statement of all this. The part that those crazy theologians miss is that this is the means by which, outside of time and space, that we unite ourselves, our lives, not just our death, but our lives to God. We unite ourselves in and especially through our sufferings of our life to God. Now, if I asked you when did the passion begin, what would you say? Most people answer, hey, right, the garden, right? Because the garden didn't, didn't he, uh, you know, sweat blood in things. And the answer to the first question I pose to you is, why would you say that? Because in the garden, nobody hit him. In the, gar in the garden, what happened? Why was he sweating blood? What was going on? All he was doing was praying. So how could prayer be such a tremendous suffering for him. He's just deep in prayer. From a medical perspective, you'd say it must be something psychologically wrong with him, right? 
If this guy's just sitting, if she's just sitting and praying, she's breaking down and tear, crying up, and she's sweating blood, and she's a mess. I'd say, girl, you you need help. <laughs> Maybe you ought not pray so deeply, right? Yeah. You, you begin to wonder about her psychological well-being, wouldn't you? Right? Because the real issue is this. Let's be very clear. The suffering of the human soul and the suffering of the divine soul is far greater than anything of the body. The ecstasies of the soul are greater than the ecstasies of the body. The sufferings of the soul are greater than the sufferings of the body. Okay? So our Lord says to the apostles, my soul sorrowful to the point of death. He's brought that far down. What then? What then? So the first question I have to address, or the next point I want to flush out a little bit, Scripture doesn't actually say, does it, that he sweat drops of blood? It says he sweat, he has sweat like drops of blood. So let's make that little caveat. Like drops of blood. But did you know in the ancient manuscripts, the oldest ones we have, this is not even in the Bible. This actually is a later adaptation, what they call New Testament deuterocanonical. Okay. New Testament. In other words, some of those scriptures that later on appear to have been sort of Split in. So, New Testament, not oldest. But the point is what? Why then? It's, but understand very clearly, Catholic Church clearly teaches this is, the, this is the canonical word of God. So that's not to be questioned. The question you have to ask yourself then, why did the apostles and why did the church believe that this belonged in here? What about this is so profound? And the answer is that it's telling us something very clear that any person here would know that Jesus Christ is under a tremendous amount of distress. He's not just upset like I am because the Buckeyes lost a football game. <laughs> He's in a tremendous state of utter extreme crisis. This, this notion in medicine of hematidros, which literally means blood in the sweat gland, is well known in the medical literature, but it's rare. And it's only present in the states of extreme stress and anxiety. Extreme to the point of crisis in a person. Their very existence. So medically what we know is happening, the, auto, the nervous system is in a state of crisis. We call it the autonomic nervous system, which controls the things in our body, like adrenaline and sweating and heart racing and pumping. Now keep in mind, this is a night where it is cold. He's got cold night air. And yet he's sweating so profusely that it looks like blood. No, question, is it blood or not blood? Irrelevant. The point is, it's telling you that he is in a state of extreme crisis. And the next question you have to ask then is, why? We heard in one of the songs that one of the things. So the, the, the things, this is, or a medicine doctor can't answer this question. This is a theologian. This is this is the mystics who answer these questions for us. The first thing they say is that Jesus saw what was coming. He saw every nail, every bruise, every beating, every, every, everything thrown at him. He saw it. He saw what was coming. Number two, he knew what he was going to give, and he saw that there was still, despite that, would be souls that would tell him, I don't want any part of your heaven. I don't want any part of your gift. It's better to, better to rule in hell than serve in heaven the people that would reject God, the souls that would be lost. Very heavy in our Lord. The evangel, this is one that we get from the mystic and Catherine Emmerich. Personal matters. Little things like in Scripture where Jesus didn't heal everybody. The devil would say to him, don't you love her? You heal this guy but not her? What sort of God are you? I mean, I, we, we, obviously you don't care that much. Huh? You didn't heal everybody. You weren't very kind to this to this person. You know we don't get this lovey dovey Jesus, and so the devil's attacking him over things like that. Okay, okay. So, but this is this is the biggie here. This is the one that, as all of us know, is where the action is. <laughs> Every sin that you and I ever have or will commit. Every sin that our ancestors committed, every sin that our great 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 grandchildren will commit, Jesus Christ saw and took upon himself. And so, as St. Paul says, he who knew no sin was made sin. Not just external to it, he completely drew it into himself. That's why it almost killed him. The amount of deadly awfulness he took upon himself. 
to the point where it itself almost destroyed him. That's the kind of suffering we're talking about. So he will switch focus to the physical sufferings because no sooner does he do this than he has to stand and face his accuser who comes. So understand emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, everything unravels. He's going to be up on his feet for hours. Try standing for 12 hours. Okay, he's not going to be off his feet until he's knocked down from a cross or beaten onto the ground. The apostles aren't there to support him. He's completely alienated. He's being left alone. He sees what's happening. He's begging them for help. They won't. He's arrested after midnight. He's into the time of darkness like we had the scripture reading tonight, that it's dark. And the reason it's dark is because that's the time of power. That's when Satan's power is. Nighttime and darkness has always been the time that to a Jew was illegal to have a trial at night. The guards aren't the kind of guards that play nice. These are the kind of guards who innocent or guilty or is irrelevant to them. They are the sort of demonic people that love to smash and punch and kick and hurt you for nothing, even though you haven't even been accused of anything. If there's any chance they can hurt somebody, they will. These are the kind of psychopaths that they put in these positions. In the subterranean prison overnight where our Lord stayed, where he was on his feet all night in this position where he can't stand, he can't sit down, he's hit chained here. So they are doing everything possible leading up to the big time now where he moves before Annas, the true power in Judaism at the time. He was in Caiaphas, but his, his father-in-law, Annas. Annas really determines at that moment, Jesus will die. Everything else is going to take place, unfold from here. So this nighttime trial, it's illegal. They're going to blindfold him. They're going to spit him. They're going to call him names. Bash him in the head as they blindfold him. Which probably hell will be a play the prophet. Who hits you? Who hits you? Okay, so pulling things out of his beard, smashing him, kicking him. And then they did a lot of horrible things that I can't go into right now. Repeated physical attacks, unprovoked, undefended. He didn't fight back. He didn't. He turned the other cheek. He didn't fight back. He didn't claim innocence and sit and beg like some, please, please, please. Remember who's in charge. Who knows what's happening and who's deciding the way it moves. So we've got three times Pilate declaring Jesus innocent. But he doesn't take, he doesn't bother, he doesn't worry about abusing him and beating him and beating him and insulting him and sending him off to Herod where he would get, you notice with Herod, the white can of this robe, uh, he goes before Herod, Herod says he wants to see a miracle, there's no miracle to be had, Jesus doesn't even say a word to him. Jesus is not even going to deal with this guy. Herod is going to insult Jesus all the more by placing the can of this robe, which is what you give a king. That's why when he sends it back to Pilate, Pilate thinks, Scripture says they became friends, because Pilate sees the humor in that. Oh, he's your king. He's a king. We know you're the king, Herod, but, you know, he's, this, is, this, is, this is the guy, right? So it's part of this mockery of our Lord. But now back to the abuse. They're abusing him all the time. You know, they beat him after, after Herod. The soldiers would beat him. On the way, they beat him. They're kicking. They're punching him. They're bashing him. They're knocking him down. Pilate, however, then finally moves forward to scourging. Now, you understand the scourging was typically naked. The scourging was typically done in preparation for what? Crucifixion, right? In preparation. Everybody knows what's coming. Remember, Anderson already declared it. Innocent three times. Yet the death sentence on Gabbatha, which is the seat of pronouncement, is the seven Golgotha, the wordplay that's used in Scripture a lot. Now, when we talk about the scourging, anybody seen the movie The Passion? Mm -hmm. It truly needs to be fixed in your mind. Now, some people say I was too bloody. It didn't happen that way. Well, <laughs> Yeah. Probably a little bit more bloody, but let's be very clear as we see why this is, would not be questioned. The device used this flagellum. Notice leather. Notice there's a couple things here. Metal balls, see them? Made out of lead. Little bits of bone, sharp fragments made for cutting. All right. Jesus is going to be nakedly strapped to a post. There's two guards, two, of, two executioners, who everyone knows that what's going to happen. Understand this. 
Jewish scourgings would be 39 blows, and that's it. In other words, don't kill them. Take it up. See, literally, we count to 39. No, we count to 38, 39. Not so with the Romans. The Romans' rule was this. You beat them as hard as you can. You make them hurt as hard as you can, but don't kill them because we want to kill them on the cross. But if you can take them as far as you can, good. Ultimate humiliation, ultimate pain. They have an agenda here, which we'll talk about. The Romans have no admonition, no rule against how what they want to do to them. It's entirely up to the executioners how far they deem the strength of a man. Now, Jesus had did what for a living? Carpenter. Carpenter. In the ancient world, carpenters worked with what? Stone. Stone. That's right. The Greek word's tecton. It's not actually carpenters, tecton. And it's more like a construction worker. So Jesus would have worked with stone. We know Jesus and Joseph were men's men. They weren't wusses. They were men with muscles and strength. In that culture, you had to be. So these guys know this. These are soldiers. They know who their enemies are and how to attack. They see the muscular strength of Jesus. They see the look in his eyes. He has no fear in his eyes. They know what that means. That means they have to escalate things very, very hard. And this they do. They strike. These are called strikes. Notice the whip blows. This to this side. This to this side. You see how they strike in the angles? You notice that pattern. These are called strikes. We're going to see that in a minute. These patterns are deliberate. It, we'll, we'll see why. But typically, these implements here, the, the, the hard metal balls would bash the person causing blood underneath. There would be internal bleeding in the muscle. Then you'd have this implement, the, the sharp shred, as they pull back on it, would then open the skin up so that there would be bleeding underneath. But it would clot pretty quickly because you're staying away from major vessels on the back. You're all muscle, right? And we know Jesus would have had good, strong muscle. The shroud, just as a little nice little aside, because I always have to step back a little bit, you know, to kind of take us the edge off. The shroud was a nice deep understanding of the way they would wrap the body. Um, notice it would not come in direct contact with all the body, but a good portion of it. That's what's so striking about the shroud is it shows so much detail under the modern researcher's eye. When you look upon the, the shroud, we can see all sorts of things. There's, there's the, the whip, the marks, and, and the beatings and angles. We've got uh, the, the evidence of the crown of thorns and the whipping wounds and this posterior abuse. We got literally hundreds of, of marks. 2,000 years later, you still see this. That we've never been able to reproduce. Nobody's ever been able to reproduce. So we're not talking just a little whip. We're talking these God-forsaken things. Crown of thorns. Notice how it goes about the whole head. We're not talking a crown around the front. This is not unique to Jesus. The Romans used to do this pretty regularly because it was part of their ultimate humiliation of a person. They used to have this little mock, little pseudo-sexual ceremony where they would mock and humiliate this person as a king. With this sort of <coughs> thing we'll uh, talk about. But notice that these thorns, however, therefore penetrate the skull at all angles. The principal places that the Romans wanted to place these crowns would be the nerves here on the side and the nerves in the back. These are the main nerve branches for the skull. Okay, So their intent was that no matter what would happen, if the crown is shifted or moved in any way, the thorns through these areas would then drive into the nerves. That's why it would go over the entire head. So we can see the crown of thorns. Here even, still see the major blood spots, which actually match quite clearly what the mystics have noted at those locations. Quite interesting. Side wound. So we've got you know lots of depictions here. Look at here, even here, two thousand years later. Computer generated actual facial image from the shroud. What do you look like? That's what do you look like? The Romans had a concept of peace in their empire. The Roman Empire is not much different than America's empire. You were welcome to serve whatever religion you want, as long as you didn't impose it. You could do as you please. You just got to follow our religion and whatever our religion dictates, mandates for. Uh, but you followed our laws. You followed our laws. You break our laws. You, you will make a terrible example of you. Horrific example of you. These men were cruel. 
cruelty on the troops. Okay, here's what the Romans used to do. They used to take the, the soldiers stationed in Jerusalem would have traditionally been cultures that hated the Jews. Does that make sense? Because the Roman Empire is why. So they could take subjugated people they knew hated the Jews and station them right in Jerusalem. Because then what? You've got soldiers that show no mercy. No mercy whatsoever. And won't be bought off through collaboration. Hey, give me some money and I'll, I'll make sure your loved one gets away safe. No, no, no. These, this is the type of hatred that you have about the Nazis and the SS with the Jews. Maybe a German soldier would have let some of the Jewish people go. But no way would an SS man, right? This is what the Romans know. So they put these monster types of demon troops in charge here. No limits to the scourging. We talked about that. Push it to, all, to the dead. Ultimate humiliation and mockery. Remember, the whole point is that we're going to maintain peace in our kingdom. And then we talked about the crown of thorns, this burlesque type of mockery. Scripture doesn't even want to go there. Remember what I said? Remember I said at the beginning how difficult this was to you and I to look at an electric chair or something? Early Christians looked and said, we can't even talk about this. The gospel writers, you can as if see them, you notice how few words they say about the crucifixion? And they took Jesus out and crucified him. And then let's move on. They didn't spend many words because they couldn't spend many words. This is too painful. The thought of Jesus being humiliated and mocked in this way. Some horrific death of this nature. Now, remember I said that we talked about this. The, 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 you know, there's, all, there's a ton of prophecies in the Old Testament that said this is the way it had to be. In, in Isaiah especially, we see a lot of them. There's a called the Four Suffering Servant Songs in Isaiah. And the third one in Isaiah 50 talks about the things we see with our Lord. Giving his back to those who struck him. Cheeks to those who pulled his beard out. He didn't hide from them. He wasn't, he wasn't uh, you know, turning his face away from their shame and their spitting and all the disgusting, disgusting things they did to him. Because the Lord God would be with him and his face would be like flint. He would not turn away. He is not a coward. He knows what's going on. He sees the big picture. He has the strength and power and the authority from the Father in heaven to accomplish this. But he draws his power from God in heaven. He has our infirmities. A poor suffering servant song, Isaiah 52. Remember during that? Even more powerful. We're going to have this probably good Friday. Okay. So our infirmities he bore. Our sufferings he endured. He was pierced for our offenses. Remember, this language is very clear in terms of crucifixion understanding. Early Christians understood this right away. Chastisement, making us whole. By his stripes. Look at here, stripes, right? He had all gone astray like sheep. The Lord laid upon him the guilt of us. Our guilt on him. Not fair for him, right? It's not fair. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted, he didn't open his mouth like a lamb led to slaughter. So the language is very clear. Sacrificial language being thrown in here. Notice about the lamb, right? Oppressed, condemned. You know, we looked at him as being, ugh, ugh. Oh, we don't want to talk about this. This is just too ugly. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't do anything wrong at all. Yet that he paid for us. Offering, he gives his life as an offering for sin. A sin offering, right? Because of his affliction, he shall see. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many. Their guilt he'll bear. So he takes it. On the shroud, move back to that. Because I have to move back and forth to keep people from getting... Icky. And so on here, the posterior view of the shoulder, seen on the shroud, clearly showing where the cross was. Okay, the Romans didn't invent uh, crucifixion. Everybody understand the Romans did not invent it. Persians and Carthaginians used it quite a bit. But it's the Romans who took it to a whole other level. They would use it frequently with their soldiers. And in the course of the battle, if they particularly wanted to make an example of some others, they would crucify other soldiers. Their opposite people they had conquered. They had learned anatomy very well, learned sword, torture and suffering very, very, very well. Romans were very, very smart about knowing how far they could push people, about how to size up their enemy, what to do to maximally get across the fact that they're in charge. There's peace here when you do it our way. 
So it was so bad, though, crucifixion, that it wasn't done on Romans. That's why St. Paul was not crucified, technically speaking, right? <laughs> I'm sure he was glad of it. But he made that point out of saying, now listen, I, I am, can't remember I'm a Roman citizen? <laughs> okay. So let's, let's be clear about that. Cicero says that it was, the, well, the exception to that would be if you're a Roman soldier and you desert it. Okay, that would be, that'd be bad. That'd be bad. You'd be crucified. And they knew what that meant. So Roman soldiers didn't, didn't typically desert if they could in any sense about it whatsoever. Because we're now talking a quick death. Let's get it over. Because why? It will be drawn out. It will be the most cruel and disgusting thing. Cicero, great politician, philosopher of Rome, he says they cut out the tongues. The Romans cut out their tongues. They couldn't stand to listen to these men curse and blaspheme God while they're suffering. They get to the point they cut their tongues out. Josephus said it was the most, in a Jewish historian, the most ratchet of deaths. So you have to ask yourself that question. Why then did he choose it? Remember, it's Jesus who chooses this. Why? Why? The execution team, five soldiers. There's one in charge. Exactor mortis. The other four soldiers just do what they said. But make no mistake, these guys are psychopaths. These are the kind of people you see in the movie. And their intent is what? Total suffering. Their intent is not just to kill you. I could kill you and get it over with and go home for dinner. But that isn't the point. They're psychopaths. They delight in seeing human beings suffer. Especially who? Men who hate the Rome, who hate the Jews, hate rabbis in particular. They had nothing but disdain and disgust for Jesus. He represented everything they hated. So they were trying to break him mentally, break him physically, break him psychologically, break him spiritually, break him emotionally, break him socially. There's nobody around. Try to get close to the cross. It's a dangerous thing. Mother Mary took her life in her own hands doing that. It was illegal. You didn't just get to go up and do those sorts of things. Why? Because their intent was to alienate you. Rip him naked. Humiliate him. They would love nothing more than to watch somebody from the cross sit and curse and, and hallucinate and think they were, you know, some the devil himself. They love to watch human beings completely decimated to, to show their mastery. The crucifixion itself, there were different types of crosses. That's what this slide's about. The two that I'll point out for your attention are the, the humilis and the subliness. So you can see the humilis are humility, low, okay, low, subliness, sublime, like tall. So there are two types of crosses principally, the high ones and the low ones. So the ones, the low ones would be like four foot high, five foot high, you'd be down by the ground. Why? Because you had no family, you had no friends. When you die, you're going to hang on the cross and we don't want to put you away. So what we'll do is we'll eat you out there, let the animals eat you. So the low one would be for the low life. But if we want to make sure everybody knows who you are, and we're in charge, the high one. The high one. So everybody can see. And we're going to make the supreme example. And everybody knows the high cross. That's somebody important. Who's that going to be? It's going to be Jesus. He was on the high cross. Well, we don't know, we don't know if it was if it, it was a cross piece up or not. Okay? The article from Jama, by the way. But Jesus would have carried the patibulum, which is the cross piece. 75 pounds. They couldn't carry the whole thing. He didn't have the strength to do it. They traditionally would carry the cross piece because these would be fixed in the ground and used over and over again, right? So it would be hanging here or there was the T. They did have the T. But when this would work, people say, well, where would you put the sign above the head? The answer is, well, there was room. They could put this right on top. And it's not a problem. You can see how it's, it's, it can actually be fixed, and, and they've shown through, step, through research that that actually is the case. So this is the Tillis, which is the sign that condemned carries through the street or is carried with the, with the cohort, showing why you're being crucified. Why are you being murdered? In the case of Jesus, because Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews, right? He claimed to be a king. It's going to be in Hebrew, it's going to be in Latin, it's going to be in Greek, right? The nails. Oh, we're not talking the ones that you use for your two by fours. So the question is this: another one for you to pose through the hand. Ancient, all the ancient sources all say through the hand. They all do. Modern people all say through the wrist. What gives? So theoretically, if you look at the structure and anatomy of the hand, what do you notice? Wrist bone here. Here's your wrist. Strong. There's all these bones here. Notice there's an artery here, 
See it? And then there's nerves right underneath. This is perfectly placed because these masters of execution know what they're doing. They don't want you to die. If you hit an artery, you bleed out and die. And the whole point is we don't want you to die quick. They've got to let you suffer. So stay away from the artery. They're very good at their anatomy. They knew that. And they knew there was a nerve here. Hit that nerve. Now, has anybody hit a nerve? Anybody ever had sciatica? Ever had back surgery? You know what I'm talking about. When a nerve is irritated. Now, could you imagine a nail driven right through a nerve? The pain is just unbelievable. They say it's the worst pain there is. Causalgia. This nerve pain. It's just horrible. It's unremitting. It just propagates everywhere to the point you're going out of your mind. So they believe, modern researchers, that it was through the wrist because the hand wouldn't tear away on the cross. But I will challenge this a bit. Barbet, during the 40s and 50s, the French surgeon said definitely through the wrist. So that could be the modern guy says, He's most recently really the expert in the modern day now. Says that could well have been through the palm, but out through the wrist. So how would you do that? Take your hand, take your hand, look at it this way. Now tilt your hand forward a bit. Out of the palm, out the wrist. See that? Accomplishes that. Still got a lot of strength. Still avoids the vessels. Everything's good to go. Corresponds with everything. So the modern Zugabee says, it's quite possible it's still through the palm, or, uh, yeah, through the palm of the hand. It explains everything. Because what we know from the shroud, and when the shroud, what you'll see, is that you can only see the blood on the wrist, on the back side. You can't see the front side, so you don't, we don't, can't, can't tell from that. But the stigmatists, like Padre Pio and them, all bleed where they bleed from. <coughs> you'll bleed from the palms, don't they? Isn't that interesting? <coughs> so anyway, what you'll see here, see the blood here at the wrist? Yeah. Can't, can't, just can't tell from the other. So, the wrist again. That's what we're seeing. The wrist now. Feet. Nailing in the feet. Same type of theory. Okay? Stay away from vessels. The good news is there's not too many major vessels here. But remember the purpose of the feet, because the legs are bent, is to be able to push up. So it needs to be in a position, like a click, right? Uh, where, where there's strength along the <coughs> axis of the body to be able to push up and strength. Yet you don't hit an artery. And, you, and, and, and there are some nerves here. So they do hit the nerves. Remember, they want to hit nerves, but not arteries. So the nail holes on the cross that's blown up, hard to see. Here's all the heel bones that they found in, the, in excavations in Israel of the, half of the heel bone that had a nail through it. The Romans couldn't get it back down, so they just threw it in the grave. They couldn't deal with it. They couldn't get the nail back out. So it's through. Why? Because remember, executioners have the ability and authority to do whatever they want. Their job, they got their end result. They know their orders. If they want to nail through the side, they can nail through the side. There wasn't one way of doing it because we're talking over hundreds of years that the executioners would do whatever they felt at the time. You know, what are you going to use a tree? Are you going to use a piece of wood? Uh, are you going to strap them up? You know, what do you want to do with them? So the executioners had, had the ability with any execution to be able to modify what they're doing. So in this instance, it was driven through the side of the foot so the person could push up from the side of the cross. Okay, now let's go back to this. The thorn on the skull, here's it from, you know, from the movie. Actually, it would have been over the head, as you mentioned. <coughs> But notice how they're intended to cover them this area, and then this. it should have been down here, but it would be through this area. So, let's look at this, this reality. This is where it gets a little harder. When a person is on the cross and has to pull up, remember these stripes that we talked about? Why they put them at an angle? Look what happens to a person at this angle when they pull up in their arms. What happens to these wounds? They open up. They all open right back up, don't they? So they have bleeding, they had stopped, they had horrific pain, they have starting to quiet down. Not so when you pull up, it opens everything back up. But the other thing that happens that when you pull up in that cross is your head is against the weight of the wood of the cross, it drives the thorns, the crown of the thorns, forward, shoving all those simultaneously into you. Now, I gotta show you a disturbing picture. Okay, this is this is what those blasted SS monsters did to some Catholic priests in Dachau. Dachau is where they kept the Catholic priests. And when they would murder them, they would murder them in this fashion, stringing them up in a mock crucifixion, mocking our Lord. It was their intent, very clearly stated. And one notice that the priest's arms were were back here above their head. Now, Catholic priests are very good about, like doctors, noting details and recording them. And the one things that they noted were that he seems to be dying of trouble breathing. 
and it's not taking that long. So it's a very important insight, because what it tells us is that when a human being, when your arms are above your head, in this fashion or that fashion, you can breathe in, but you can't breathe out. You suffocate, in essence. That's with the arms directly above the head. And so if you were to be crucified at this angle, this Jesus here, arms above head, would have died of trouble breathing pretty quickly. He wouldn't have languished on the cross for two days. It might be in a short while, he'll die of trouble breathing. What about this Jesus? Let me ask you that. This Jesus who's completed at 90 degrees. What would his experience in the cross be? Trouble breathing? No. He could breathe just fine. If the Romans wanted a person to sit on a cross for two days and make an example of them, they would put him in this position. If they wanted him dead within 20 minutes because they got to get to dinner, they're going to crucify him upside down. So in the first case, this person cannot breathe. This person can breathe fine. He's just going to wear down. So the question is, what about Jesus? What did he experience? This is where you, you go back to the science. If you were to do an experiment looking at the angle we see the blood on the shroud, see this? Now we've got some angles to understand. It appears to be about 65 degrees is where our Lord would be. So it turns out that crucifix over there is not too far off. It's not too far off. And then the question you have to ask yourself, if you're an onlooker, if you're Mother Mary looking up at your son at the cross, is what is he my seeing? What is it being experienced by my son? What is being experienced as Christians about what our Lord is giving? I will throw this in as a reminder. Most times in crucifixions, especially with the arms bearing such weight, the dislocation of the shoulders was very commonplace. And Anne Catherine Emmerich, and I'm not going to read it, but in her writings talks about when she looked and she had the visions of our Lord, she said the joints all looked like they were all out of place. The shoulders, elbows, everything looked like it was out of place. Like, my gosh, it doesn't even look like normal anatomy. What did they do to it? So what she was confirming as a mystic is she's seeing what we knew the Romans would do. They would dislocate joints. So now you're talking about uh, uh, dead Mary. Anybody have a strained muscle? It's really hard to use it. You know, I got a muscle strain. You know, it's hard to use it. Now, dislocate it? Try to pull up. The only thing that can do that, the only thing that can drive you through that kind of pain is what? Trouble breathing. Mm -hmm. And concurrently, one other thing, profound muscle spasm. So, on the cross, initially, our Lord probably experienced the ability to breathe fairly well when he had strength. So most of the statements we have from our Lord on the cross are going to be earlier on where he has strength to speak. Because to speak, you need to exhale. On the cross, you can inhale, but you can't exhale as you start falling into this position. See it? So as he grows weaker and weaker and weaker, now he's having more and more difficulty, what? Breathing. And he can't speak so easy. And as you drive deeper into that position, you see what happens. The person has to start pulling back up to breathe the air out, to exhale, to expel the air. Okay? So it's the opposite. It's the opposite of what we normally think about in terms of physiology. I'm not going to go through all that, but it, it takes work. You and I breathe in naturally. Right? On the cross, is flipped. On the cross, Air goes in, but it won't come out. So what I want to do is put it all together now. Here's my understanding, sort of a modern understanding, of what our Lord would have experienced. Initially, on the cross, he's in an angle where he can breathe. But he's wrapped in such extreme pain, and he's lost so much blood, that he's in a state of shock. As his systems are shutting down and getting weaker and weaker, his ability to hold himself up continues to become harder and harder because he needs his legs to push up on, and they just don't have it anymore. As he falls further into this position, oxygen in his body starts to fall, carbon dioxide starts to build up in the tissues. When carbon dioxide builds up in the tissues, you, that's acid and you develop an acid state. 
and his bicarbonate, all these acids, and all these acids we don't go through, and these chemicals, lactic acid, all these things develop in the system. What happens to the person's muscles? They go into a state of contraction. Has anybody ever had a leg cramp or something? <laughs> that is a small taste of what this is like. He cannot, he's an absolute profound contraction and cannot even move it. So the only thing that can drive him back up to this point instead of saying, why don't you just let it go and die? Because remember, the Romans didn't want to let you die. They didn't want you committing suicide on the cross. They didn't want you doing that. What did the Romans want you doing? Suffering maximally. So as you loop into this state, what happens? That muscles contract. You have no choice but to pull back up. Through the nails. As you do that, it opens up your back. As you do that, it drives the thorns deeper into your skull. It renders all the pain. As you pull through that, your arms, which are dislocated, and the nerves pulling through to the point of utter agony, not in one place in his body, that he doesn't have pain. To the point where he, as he grows weaker and weaker, cannot go through these gyrations we call the death throes. He's, and he can't do it. So anything he says is of great importance. He's not giving lengthy speeches like we heard in tonight's gospel, is he? Mm -hmm. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. This day you'll be with me in paradise. Woman, there's your son. Son, there's your mother. Psalm 22, Ali, Ali, Lama, Sabachthani. I thirst. It is finished. And Father, you're in your hands. I command my spirit. Just a quick word about them. What you want to notice about these is there are three... There are four groups basically that are attacking Jesus and they're all tempting him to back off the course. They're all asking him to let it go. You know, you, you remember in what happened in the desert? The devil said to him, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross. If you're the son of God, make, make that stone bread. In other words, your identity itself is being challenged. So look at the devil attacking. You understand these groups are the devil himself speaking. If you're the one, the Son of God, the Messiah, come down from the cross, I don't believe. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself. Save us. Don't you love us? Aren't you going to save us? If you're the king. Why don't you save yourself? If you're the Son of God. These things mirror the temptations we see in the desert. We know who they're from. Business, the first Christian. A good insight here. Because what Dismas did, the first Christian evangelist, people say he just had faith in God and he was saved. The answer is that he did more than that. Think about that. He scolded someone else for attacking our Lord. He stepped up and declared that you are, we've been condemned justly. This man has done nothing criminal. You and I can all see he's innocent. This is, this is bogus. This man has done nothing and you know it. How can you sit and rail against him when he's done nothing to hurt you? He's done nothing to hurt anybody here. Yet, yet he's being tortured brutally. This is not fair. You know it. I know it. But even more than that, not only is it not fair, Jesus, remembering me coming to your kingdom, I'm starting to see that the kind of kingdom you're talking about isn't like a, this, this Caesar guy. You're forgiving people. Remember the whole context. You're forgiving those who are doing this. And there's a peace about you despite all this. What is going on? You really are kingly. What sort of kingdom is this? Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Appealing for God's mercy. Woman, behold your son, son, your mother. Okay, from the cross, Jesus Christ has just made his mother ours. Our earthly mothers, as much as we love them, are with us only for a few decades. But Mother Mary's with us as our mother forever. And you're going to say, how is that? And the answer is very clear. The answer is clear. You've got, to know your, you've got to know your scripture. In John's gospel, only the word woman is used twice, right? Anybody ever think of one other time? Cana. What else do we see in John's gospel, woman used? Cana. Wedding feast of Cana. Woman, what concern is that of mine? Why is John doing this? Remember, this is John's gospel. John's a second generation Christians, in essence, who know their faith. What is John saying to them? John is going back to something they all knew, and that's from the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, woman was who? Eve. It was Eve. Precisely. Precisely. 
And the promise was that the woman and her offspring would destroy the serpent and his offspring, right? So what happens here is that the beloved disciple, you see scripture frequently in John's gospel, you ever notice John never calls himself, the beloved, he never calls himself, and he doesn't say me, I, he always uses that term beloved disciple. And the one thing that the scholars have all said for centuries is, Every time you insert blood, if you, you put your own name in there or yourself in that place, it says the same thing, but it becomes personal. So John deliberately uses this language to draw us in. That, well, that's your mother. Those are your sins, that's your mother. Those are, in other, so you see, understand what I'm saying about John's gospel. Does that make sense? You see a lot of questions out there. Well, love disciple is you and me. It isn't just John. It's intended to be you and I. So Mother Mary from the cross, one of the things he does is he gives, woman, there's your son, son, there's your mother. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is actually, believe it or not, Psalm 22 is one of the Toda Psalms. Remember we talked about the Toda? Toda Psalms. This is, if you were told, you were praying Toda, you would pray a Toda Psalm. Psalm 22 begins in this utter horrible state. Why have you forsaken me? But it finishes what? In a state of praise and thanksgiving to God for saving me. Right? So Jesus knows, and you everybody standing there knows, especially the Pharisees, whoa, whoa, Toda Psalm, what's he saying? We know how this ends. We always know you begin a statement, and it's finished by those around you, right? Because they're knowledge of it. So if I said to you, um, I went to the airport, there's a long line, you know, that stupid TSA, you know, 9-11. You would all know what I meant, right? Because I don't need to finish the story for you. You get it. You understand 9 11? Wow, 9 11, all those things happen. They only got TSA, got these authority. You got to go to these stupid things at the airport because of airplanes bombing buildings. So it's the same type of thing that was utilized, a common rabbinic tool in that era. Okay? One of the prayers of the Messiah, and the other thing is the Messiah would have uttered this. This was well known in, in ancient Judaism. So the time of God's presence to be revealed. I thirst. This is what you would say is an understatement. He's in a state of shock and he's dying. So what's he asking for? He's asking for that, as we mentioned before, the fourth cup to be given to him because it's done. The sacrifice is done. Mother Teresa interprets this spiritually. Of course, she says he's thirsting for our souls. So what's done in the work of redemption, right? The Passover is what's done. Psalm 22, right? So in the Old Testament, we see that that use of tetelestai, which is the word for being done, it is finished is to tell us die in Greek. And when that's used in the Old Testament, it's typically used by the priest at the temple when he's done with the sacrificial offering. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So Jesus is himself what? The priest and the victim. The sacrifice. Right. So he's now priestly, making it clear to you, this is my work as a priest of just offering myself to God above for you. And Jesus, okay, it's solid. Father, he has to command my spirit right now. Okay. So, the piercing of blood and water, why do I put it? He's already dead, right? He's already dead. He didn't feel any of this, does he? Right? Well, of course, it tells us we love it because there's some spiritual significance, too. If you pierce, Romans were excellent. Remember, the Roman soldiers know what they're doing. They stab him in the side. What? Instant death. You need to be in battle. I need to know when I strike here, that's a death blow. I can move on. I don't have to sit and walk. Did I get him or not? You need to know. So, as a soldier, your life depends on a quick strike and it gets ready for the next. So, the Romans knew to go between the ribs. Punctured lungs hit great vessels. And they knew, well, if you strike at this level, you're going to kill them. It's, an, it's a death blow. So that's why they would do this, right? So we can see that that makes sense. Why would blood and water come out? Well, blood and water comes out because there's blood in around the sack. There's also the water of, of pearl fusions and so forth. So what happens is this. Blood and water are going to come out. Even, about, uh, about, even if up to two hours after a body being dead. Okay? So we know that there's a reason John points this out to us. Again, it's John's Gospel. Why does John tell us blood and water? I mean, there's so much he could say. He didn't talk much about the other stuff. And the answer to that question should be a recognition of where this is coming from. Anybody catch what I'm saying? This is the side of Jesus from his rib. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Where else in the Bible have we seen that? Adam. Genesis, Adam, right? What comes from Adam's side? Eve. Eve. Significance of the side. Close to the heart. Did did he come from Adam's foot? No. Why what? Because that would be a sign of he's superior to her. The side is your equal. Precisely. 
So from the side of Jesus comes blood and water. In John's Gospel, water always means baptism. Blood in John's Gospel is Eucharist. The second round Gospel to second generation Christians, they know their stuff, right? So what is John trying to point out? That the bride of Christ, his equal, his bride, that he gave up his life for, Adam was supposed to do for Eve. You know that. Adam was supposed to have died in that garden for Eve. He's supposed to have taken on a serpent and let himself be slain, but he didn't. So what did he do? He cowered out. This Adam, the new Adam, does not do that because in giving death, he gives new life. He gives new creation. So what happens coming from his side is a church, his bride, according to the scripture, that is born of water, which will, if you want to be a Christian, you get baptized. That's what makes us a Christian. And blood is what sustains us, right, for the journey. This is what John wants you to be clear. Why did Jesus die ultimately? His death certificate would say he died of complete circulatory collapse from hypovolemic shock. Some people saw oh, maybe a heart failure. Some people saw oh, maybe his heart, he had a heart attack and throw throw some vegetation or he ruptures. Cardiac. This is the the the, the, the middle age uh, uh, the middle age uh, preachers love this one. Jesus died of a broken heart. His <laughs> heart ruptured. But it doesn't make any sense because he was a tecton. His heart was strong. He didn't have heart disease. It would take days for cardiac rupture to occur from modern pathology understanding. He died of complete shock. He lost so much blood that he could not carry on. That every other body system shut down. He couldn't breathe. The heart couldn't pump. The vessels couldn't flow. The kidneys shut down. He gave every last drop of blood. He could have had an arrhythmia from such loss of fluids for sure. But in the end, it's still death through shock. So, with this whole thing, he has nothing left to give. Let me ask you about St. Paul. If Paul had his head lopped off, did he still have strength in his body? Sure he did. Somebody just instantly cut his head off and he dies. This Jesus has nothing left to give. He gives every last drop. Every last drop. This stone fellow here, and we'll see that Stephen, he got stoned to death, right? So he's in pretty good shape, got lots of energy. He can sit and pray to God and everything else until somebody bams in the head and he bleeds internally in the head, and then he's done for, right? But you bash him in the leg, he's not going to die from that. They've got to get him up here, right? So why did Jesus choose this horrible, the most awful form of death ever devised? Why did he, Jesus himself, choose it? And the answer from most unanimous sources is the ugliness and the horror of sin to God. It became sin, and to God, sin is horrific. The little petty little things we do, like talking about our neighbors, is very, 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 very insulting and painful to God. And Jesus wants to make clear, you don't think it matters? Let me tell you how much it hurts me. It is God Contrary to any heretic, the man on the cross was God. Period. You understand that, right? He suffered absolutely and fully as a human being. But what the devil didn't see coming, he was a fully human and fully divine. He never would have killed him if he knew that. But he was too stupid until it was too late to see what he had just done. This complete emptying of self is God taking upon himself humanity's shame and disgust. Every drop of his blood. All of us who suffer now find a God who knows suffering. This isn't a God who stands off like some clock paper sets everything in place and doesn't know us. This is a God who says, I know well what it is to suffer. I'm there with you. All who suffer now find that God is with them. You understand that? God doesn't just stand off in a distance and say, I forgive you all of your sins. You understand that's only part of the story. Because what does God have in store for us? A divine life, right? So that means we have to be transformed somehow. It's through suffering that changes the human soul. It's through suffering that God meets us at the darkest, most awful places of our being. The Catechism says very clearly, you understand that this isn't just Jesus giving the gift of death. He gives us his life. Everything he did was a gift. Every person he forgave. Every sin he forgave, every person he healed, every prayer he uttered was his gift back to his Father. His death was part of his life. Death is a unique and definitive gift from him. Jesus substitutes his obedience for ours. Disobedience. 
Because like Adam, we're disobedient. Let's be honest. Disobedient is all hell. And so what happens is he has to be the obedient one to take on himself, to consummate the sacrifice of the cross. Our participation in Christ's sacrifice. We need to talk about this. This is where I have many of my evangelical friends who it goes right over their head. Catholic theology, brothers and sisters. God could stand right up here and he could say, you're all, everything's fine in the world. You're all forgiven. You're all good to go. All good to go. Now, you're a beautiful diamond and you're in this muck of grotesque sin, like swamp-like stuff down in quicksand. And he could stand up and say, I declare you to be clean. The reality is that's a lie. We're not clean. We're still covered in muck. We're still filthy, dirty, broken. Does everybody understand that? So let me ask you this. <clears throat> if I come home tonight and my home is on fire, and my children and wife are inside, am I going to stand outside? Oh, I don't want to go in. It's too dangerous. And the firemen say, you can't go in. It's too dangerous. And what would I say to them? <laughs> Where else would I be? The only thing I care about is in there. I'm going in, and I will get them out, or I will die trying. And it will go into the darkness and into the flames and go into the smoke and would grab their children and throw them out the window to safety and then die there if necessary, not looking to save self, but to save the ones he loves. Isn't that love? Isn't that the essence of love? Do you think God is any different? He's the perfection of the sacrifice of love. He doesn't just stand off and say, all is well in the world when it isn't. He says, no, oh, i got to go down into that God-forsaken, awful place that I'm not present, and I have to be present in that darkness. i got to go down into this world of suffering. i got to go down into the muck. i got to bring my children out of here and save them. And then none of, none of them can do it on their own. They can't do it on their own. How can they save themselves? They can't. Only I possess the ability. That means I have to go to the places I've never been, to a world I've never been, to a horrible place of suffering and of death. A God who never knew death now has to become a friend to death. But it wasn't his doing. It was all because of sin. All because of us. So God has himself to go down into those dark places. He has to experience that pain and suffering. But guess what? He has to stay in there. Because we are still there. He didn't just do it and then bolt. He's still there in the darkest places, in the most horrible places of our lives, and all those grotesque sins, and all those perversions, and all those addictions, and all those abandonments, and isolation. He's still there. When you look at the cross, people say, why do you Catholics leave that crucifix up there? Jesus died and rose. The answer is, he did die and rose. It's true. But he still hangs on the cross for me because I'm up there. I still suffer. Maybe he didn't, but he did. And he still does because then Parisi suffers because every person in this room hangs on the cross. You understand that? If you're on the cross suffering, he's there with you. He's not a stranger to it. He went to those places and he's still in those places. And I think people miss that. Because what God does is where God goes, He sanctifies it and transforms it. Humanity was disgusting. God entered it and gave it a dignity and a power and restored the dignity that was intentionally supposed to be there until sin robbed it. Now, now humanity possesses into the waters of baptism a the ability to create a divine life. Go down into the water in baptism and die. You rise to new life. It is in the waters. It is in the things because God went there. God went into the waters. Jesus was baptized. He goes down into the water. He transforms it. That water has the regenerative ability to transform the human soul, giving it a divine power, a divine life. You understand? We were not made for God just to stand and say, you're clean and pretend all is well. It isn't so. We're dirty. We're broken. But this God goes there and he says, I've got something more for you. I'm giving you out of my side my very life, not just in death. But your dignity as my bride, you are to be unstained, you are to be holy, you are to be made fresh, made new, coming forth from my side. You will be one with me as my spouse. That means we can't be anything other, not just humans, we take on a divinity. 
To understand, Scripture says we become partakers of the divine nature, as Peter says. Or John says, we're children of God, and so we are. We possess a nature from God. And how does that happen? It happens through this suffering and death. Whoever wishes to be my follower must deny himself. This is scandalous to a Christian, right? Pick up your cross. Pick up my cross? What are you talking about? Follow in my steps. Follow his example. To you get it? Not just I'm doing it for you. You're now asked to do it with me. He's empowering his bride to do the same thing he did. Now, your job is to go into the fire, save your family. Your job is to pray for those people who condemn you and hate you, and those who spit on you. Forgive them. Love them. He's empowering us to do this. I rejoice. Let this set in. St. Paul's famous teaching on redemptive suffering. Let it seep into your being. I rejoice in my sufferings. I don't know about you. I don't. I don't rejoice in my sufferings. In fact, if I was a Jew, I'd be asking, what did I do wrong? What punishment do I deserve that I'm suffering? So the question is, why is Paul rejoicing in my sufferings? The answer is for your sake. Now, wait a minute. How does Paul's sufferings help me? Because in my flesh, Paul says, I'm filling up what is lacking in the sufferings or afflictions of Christ. Did anybody see any suffering Jesus had that was lacking? What more could he have given? So what was lacking? And St. Paul says, my sufferings for your sake. Because Christ offers himself for his church. So I unite myself to his sufferings. And this releases power for others. Power. Connected to Jesus' passion transfers power. So now, and bear with me, our family members have cancer. We give the Lord our suffering and unite it with his and beg of him to use it for the one with cancer or for the others who must accept it as difficult as it is to watch others suffer so or a child who leaves the faith jettisons everything that matters in this world go after some worldly pleasure and hang out with the pigs and roll around in the pigs and long to eat their scraps the pain that that causes watching a child who's got an opiate addiction but they can't think about anything other than that next hit of drug. They can't even be free to live a life, to have dreams, to follow their hopes in their heart, but be prisoner. When we take the sufferings of our lives, like Paul, and unite it to Jesus, who's still on the cross because we're there, then what this does, it not only sanctifies our life, makes us holy. Because remember, where God is, holiness is. God goes to the suffering place. We go to the suffering place. We are made holy, uniting ourselves on the cross with him. Down in the muck. Down in the disgusting places of our, of our world. It pleases our Lord. Because like any father or any child, any parent, you want your children to love and take care of each other. Don't we? If one of my children is hurt, I want my one of my other children to pick up the phone and call them. Come help me. Be with me. It's the essence of what a family is about, isn't it? This is what sanctifies. So in the end, we, when we talk about the blood and gore, we must always come back that everything that we heard tonight was temporary. Every pain, every suffering is a drop of water in the ocean of eternity. Because Jesus Christ, outside of time and space, has invited us into divine life with him forever. Because he has risen, and he unites. If you unite yourself with him in the darkest places of your life, 
and you will be united with him in the greatest places of heaven. St. Jerome, the great biblical scholar, everybody heard of St. Jerome? Mm -hmm. He had a sexual addiction. Did you guys know that? Mm -hmm. He loved the dancing girls. Loved them. And he tried moving to areas where it was cold so he wouldn't have such passion for those dancing girls, you know? He just said, I can't get them out of my head. So what did he do? He threw himself into scripture study. Memorized scriptures. Mastered Greek, Latin. Mastered Hebrew so great that Hebrew scholars came to him with questions. Because he threw all that energy of addiction into that. And it still wouldn't leave him. God used all that energy of the sinfulness to create these beautiful scriptures. But he still was an addicted man. And at one Christmas, he went to Bethlehem. And he shacked up in one of the caves. And our Lord appeared to him. The Lord said to him, Jerome, what will you give me for my birthday? Lord, I'll give you all the scriptures. I'll give you all the word and the work I've done. No, that's, that's, that's not enough. Not enough. Cool. What else? Well, what about, you know, I've been living as a hermit and trying to do right. Um, I've got... Uh, I've been you know, sacrifices and penances and mortification, really trying to, you know, trying to serve the poor. I've given you know money to the poor. Uh, uh, my ministry, uh, it's not enough, Jerome. And Jerome says, I don't know then, Lord. What is it would be the gift to you that you most want from me? He says, you promise me you'll give it to me? He says, yes, Lord, I promise. I want your Addiction. Sense. Mm -hmm. Right. I want that. You see, that's what pleases God the most. Is that the suffering that he did wasn't in vain, but it was done because of our brokenness. And he wants our sins. He wants our addiction. He wants our despair, our isolation, our anxiety, our depression, fill in the blank. Whatever it is that's keeping us from him, that's leaving us prisoner. He wants it. And that's what the cross of Jesus Christ, this Lent, represents. Okay? So, I'm done. <laughs> I can't say anymore. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. I don't know if it's, it's kind of late, so I don't know if it's questions, but uh, feel free. Um, how about if we dismiss for those who need to leave, and then those who want to stay, if you're willing to stay, if other people are willing to stay, okay. do you want to do well, that? Yeah, stay for All right, so instead of forming a circle, if anybody has to leave, um, well, God be with you. <laughs> just, just take off. The rest of us, we can finish with an Our Father like we typically do, but if you have to go, this would be a decent time for you to, to depart. We, we know some people are out of schedules. The rest of us, if Ed's willing to stay, we're willing to stay. Ed, church is burned. Christ is triumphant. Amen. Amen. Watch the leg there. That's what, when you were talking about what, if, if you saw your house burning, would you run inside? Think of all those people that ran into the ground to save the crown of Jesus and the relics. And, I mean, those were things where they still risked their lives. Are you going to stay and listen? Could you imagine losing something of that? Single most important event in history of humanity. Lose the Eucharist. I get and then they said there was a huge change of the people that they were handing these out. You know, all those people in that huge change were just, just moving it out. Yeah. It um, could I ask if you had questions to speak them up so we can pick them up on the on the videotape? Thank you. So 
Sometimes um, things that are pretty emotional are hard to kind of cock in the hand. Some, some people later on, they've got like, ooh, we felt that. Um, Ed, I just recently read about the Greek word agon. It has to do with wrestling or, or a wrestler, and then from which we get the word agony. Um, that was I, I was really happy to learn that because it, it Jesus was wrestling with all these temptations and the you know this desire not to do it, but knowing he had to do it, and it was the Father's will. And so I really appreciated learning that the agon, the wrestler. Yeah. Right, right. So we have that we have that that word used in the Greek in the description of the garden. The apostles also were, were struggling as well, and so we have this notion that they just drank too much wine and were passed out. But there's a, there's a moral in, in scripture that in terms of being asleep is usually to denote a moral weakness that people are trying to do things morally of their own accord. So, for example, I try to be a good person and I do it on my own, but without the Lord, then I'm doomed to fail. And that's the test that Jesus is saying to them is, you will fail this test. You will fail this test if you try to do this yourself. Mm -hmm. You cannot do this your own. You have to be connected in prayer to the Lord. And if you're sleeping, you're certainly not going to be able to do that. So that's the notion that the script gospel writers want us to see, that if we're going to face the trial to come, we need to be in a state of prayer, not in a state of sleep. We need to be morally not drawing on ourselves, but drawing on the Lord. So that's sort of the, the scripture exegetical interpretation of that passage in, in mm -hmm. this Sunday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I am suffering from something, what is my attitude to be now that I know this? How do I pray? Do I pray? Do I change my prayer method? There is the question of questions, brothers and sisters. And I was hoping you wouldn't ask that. <laughs> <laughs> Father Cantu Mesa quotes one of the desert fathers on this. And he says, our attitude towards suffering needs to be different than it is for others. I must of my own accept the suffering in my life and give that and unite that to Jesus as a gift. That's between him and me, like Paul, for others, and for myself. I rejoice in that. However, if we're talking about the sufferings of others, I have the right and duty to stand before God and say, like the child in the home, or the home's on fire, Lord, give me the strength to relieve that suffering. Let me go there to get them so they won't suffer. So the Christian has this dual understanding that we accept what the Lord gives to us. Carry this cross deal with the suffering and we give it to him. If he chooses to, for, to, to heal us through another who loves us so, see how it goes both ways? But our attitude towards, say, your suffering or yours is that I must not accept that. I must demand that our Lord, if it be permissible in this world, relieve that suffering, try to heal it. Okay? So we have a different attitude, therefore, as the ancient, as our desert fathers would say. That we have to be of two minds. In the one sense, we will accept our own suffering, and in another, we will not accept it from others. We will do what we can to relieve their suffering. Yeah, they in turn can do the same for us. Now, I might accept my suffering, but you might be praying that I'm healed. Right? Why? Because that's what fathers, families do, right? That's what families do. So that's a really powerful question, this issue of suffering. Because this goes to the core of when we pray for others, right? When we pray for healing for others. I don't always know what the Lord wants. Sometimes there are people that have some disease or malady that he wants them to have. He's doing something with it, you know. But yet he still wants to meet them there in and through us and in through others, right? So this issue of suffering is for ourselves versus for others is a very interesting one. Well, along those lines, then, you know, there were there are some of the saints who did amazing, oh, dastardly things to themselves so that they would induce suffering on right. themselves. But if that was not given by God, then is that appropriate to Precisely. do? Precisely. And that's where one has to be in prayer. Mm -hmm. Their saints would say that to you, that it's in through prayer that they get a sense of what the Lord wants them to do. To go out and just inflict pain on yourself 
is not necessarily what the Lord wants. Mm -hmm. It's sort of what is it? Wait a minute, masochism or I can't remember those strange Was it? Yeah, yeah, right. So those flagellating characters, you know, is that really what the Lord wants? I think, you know, you and I would say, man, it doesn't seem to quite. But some of the greatest saints did do it. And so the question always is, did the Lord say that to them in prayer? I want you to inflict suffering. Because what if you didn't have any suffering? You're completely healthy and you look at our Lord and you want to suffer for him. But you know, nobody's, there's really nothing to happen to you. <laughs> so you can wait till it happens. Or you can be like, these guys beat themselves silly. He's like, ah, yeah, now I know pain. Yeah, I give that to you, Lord. So... In a sense, it, that, that says to me, it's like trying to do it on your own a little bit. So I've always been one of those who said, eh, I don't think. And the church would say to you, if you were to go out and flagellate yourself, why don't you go see a doctor and get some help? Okay? <laughs> you probably need to see a psychiatrist. Because you look at that and say, eh, that doesn't really, that spirituality doesn't fit anymore. You know, because it was a misunderstanding of that stuff. So we would say in our modern understanding, you're not going to, you know, don't go flagellate yourself. So anybody would do so, he'd say, no, no, no. A good spiritual director would say, we need to have a talk here. I have a question. I have three people in my life who you quoted them. They say the same thing that you said earlier. Um, why would a loving God send their son to die? How can a loving God watch his son die? They'll pray for me. They'll say they're praying. They accept so many different parts of the Bible. But when it comes to Jesus dying on the cross, they totally reject it. They don't accept the high price that Jesus Christ paid for them. And for me, that's broken a broken heart because they're not accepting the high price of redemption. They're so it, it really hurts when they say things like that. And so what is your response to that? Well, first off, the fact that it hurts you is because the Lord wants you to pray for them and use that for them. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. He'd say, use the broken heart. It's not a coincidence. It's, it's what I want you to use and unite with my suffering because he feels the same. Like you saw how all the people that rejected him were so painful for him. Now, the man that died on the cross was God. So God can came himself to die for us. Can't miss that point. Because he realized none of us could do it. No matter how holy we are. You and I hang on that cross, it doesn't save anybody else's soul. In the same way that Jesus' gift would save all of humanity. All of humanity. The only person who can encompass all of humanity is a person who can take all the sin on himself. And that's only going to be God. So he has to take it all on himself. And he's the only one who has the power, as he says, to lay his life down, and has the power to take it up again. So he'll go down to the death, and he'll come back up, risen, refreshed, renewed, restored, and transformed life. So this, this person that dies on the cross is God himself. So there's a certain sense that in our elementary understanding of the Trinity, that we look and say that Jesus is just like a human, but he isn't really divine. But God's divine in heaven, the Father, and Jesus is just a human. That's a heresy. You understand that's a horrible heresy because that's the, that's, that's the Antichrist who denies that God came in the flesh. Okay, you understand? The Antichrist means those who, who deny that God came in the flesh. God comes in the flesh. It is Jesus himself who is God. He gives of himself. So understand that ultimately the one who dies on the cross is God himself who comes. It's the dad who runs into the home himself. He says, I will save them. And they get in, in, into this complexity, convolution, where it's like, okay, so is he saying, and he says, why have you forsaken me? Is he talking to himself? Well, that's right. We yeah. talked about that, Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was the initial, the initial reading of Psalm 22, which invokes the response, the listener, to finish it. And if you finish that psalm out, where does it lead you? Praise. Praise. Praise and thanksgiving to God in thanksgiving for what he has just done by saving me. So, that my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the other issue about it is Jesus making very clear to them. Make no mistake. I am abandoned and suffering here. You, It feels to me all the world like I've been forsaken by everybody. Now, was he? No. We had Mary there who didn't forsake him. The Father of Heaven didn't forsake him. The angels didn't forsake him. But it felt like uh, he's a human being on that cross. He's forsaken. And that's what Psalm 22 would say to you. As a human, that's where you are. And that's why you're in need of being healed in, in, in 
that's why you're in need of God's assistance, because you can't do it on your own. So their understanding of that means they need to go further into faith. They need to do a homework about our understanding and stick, instead of just stick with this literal translation where you miss, if you just stick with the literal translation, you miss everything. It's right over your head. It's just, it blows right past you. So that if they go deeper in their faith, the Lord will take them there. They'll be able to understand these deeper realities, which take us there. Because like, one of the words tonight was be open. One of these Lord saying, be open, because I want to take you deeper. I got more for you. I got more for you. Don't, be, don't, don't let your brain stop at first grade. Keep going. Right. As Catholics, I don't think we should miss the fact that our lady stood at the cross. She wasn't supposed to be there. It was against the law. You put her there. Why do you think she's there? When people can't get by for a Catholic, you should be able to move to, okay, I've got the pain, he's got the pain. That's what the rosary means. So you notice that little piece? John was not going to the cross. John went to the cross to meet Jesus because Mary took him there. Mary said, I need you to get me to him. Get me to my son. Get me to that cross. I need to be there with him. And I will stand there and support him and be one with him. The new Eve is going to be present with the new Adam doing the work of redemption, drawing us into it. So Mother Mary becomes for us not just our mother. She becomes, you see the element of mediatrix where her job is to draw us ever deeper into the very heart of Jesus. So it's not like you can't go on your own. But the truth is the rest of the apostles weren't there. It was only the one who had the association with Mary that she drew him there. Right. And in our Christian lives, if we want to go deeper into the heart of Jesus and understand these deeper realities, it's only going to be the mother of God who can take us there. Because where is she? She's in the very center of the Trinity. Who's the spouse of Mary? The Holy, Spirit. Holy Spirit. That's right. People miss it. Everybody says, oh, Joseph. No, they wasn't. Joseph was, the, Joseph was the humanness of it. But who knocked her up and made her pregnant? <laughs> right, it's the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. The true spouse, I mean, the true spouse of, and, and who is her father? The father, and who's her son? Jesus, right? She's centered in the very center of the Trinity, and what's she doing? Drawing us into the very inner life of God, as only a mother can, showing us the heart and insight of God Himself, where she's drawing us in. Doesn't take us away from Jesus, takes her even deeper into Jesus. Do you, you get that? And that's why when people say, oh, I go straight to Jesus, like, well, they go, you'd be going through Mary, because that's where she is. That's her job from the cross given, is to be there to help draw us into it. And that reality through history showed again and again, those drawn that are close to Mary are always close to Jesus. Not one of these crazy priests who's gone off crazy and acted like some pedophile. None of them had devotion to Mother Mary. It's only the ones that are the holy priests. Have you noticed that? That's been borne out again and again. Even Pope Benedict XVI said, you don't see the clerics, the clerics with all the problems still with a close association with Mary. Because one of her promises, especially the priest, was, I will keep you pure and keep you close to my son. I will help you refashion and reform Jesus in you. So that's what she does for us. So, Mother Mary takes us to the cross. She risked her life to do it. Of course she did, but she had to be there. Where else would a mother be? be? Weeping somewhere? What it drew, what gave Jesus strength was to look and see his mother there standing strong. Yes, she's racked with pain. He knows. She's not falling on the ground groveling, eating dirt. She's, she's, uh, she's standing at the cross giving him strength. I understand what you're doing. God, this is painful. But I, I see it. I know well what this plan is all about. You're giving your life for them. So that is this mother that you look and say, she draws us ever closer into the mystery of, 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 of Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection. And so that's celebrated for us you know, so many different ways. It leads us ever closer to him, not away from him. Ed, could you briefly mention pa the new Passover, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, and how the Eucharist is a continuation of the sacrifice? The best place to unite yourself to the sufferings of Jesus Christ is during the Holy Mass. That priest raises that host, he raises that cup of wine, and it becomes transformed. Jesus Christ, I unite my sufferings and all those people in my life who are suffering to you now on this cross. We are one. You gave the gift of your life to me. So this new covenant that's poured out in blood, this new covenant that is in the form of bread and wine transformed, becomes a place where we as humans can unite ourselves. It's a practical way that God gave us. It was practical for the Jew, and it's practical for the Christian. And the early Christians, the first thing they did was celebrate Eucharist. You understand that? Long before there was a Bible, right? They were gathered what? Together, breaking what? Bread. Breaking bread. Okay, that's determined in the Acts of the Apostles for what? For celebrating the Eucharist. They got together, 
they, they would read the scriptures of the Old Testament. They had no New Testament. They would celebrate the Eucharist because it's at the Eucharist, which we see Jesus on the road for Emmaus, right? Where he gathers with the apostles. He's using scripture with them. He breaks the bread, and then, boom, he disappears. Why? Because he entered into the bread. He was broken. That's why they didn't see him go anywhere, because he actually entered into it. He made it very clear to the church that Jesus Christ is present in both the bread and the wine, but also in the word, right? The scriptures. He's present in both. He's alive and real, and that's most evident in the liturgy. When we gather together, both, both in the scriptures and in the Eucharist, it is with the place for this intersection where we most unite our sufferings to God. It is a memorial event. You understand? These are memorial events taking place out of time and space. So now you and I are present in the upper room with the apostles. You and I are present in the Garden of Gethsemane with him. You're present with Mary at the foot of the cross. We're present where? At the empty tomb. We're present there with the resurrection which is our, our ultimate hope of all this. So at the Eucharist, this bled, this, the, the, the celebration of the new covenant, the old covenant brought us out of slavery from Pharaoh in Egypt. The new covenant brings us out of a greater slavery to sin and Lucifer himself into a new kingdom. We came out of the old to set up a new kingdom. We came, right? Then the Jews went on eventually build a kingdom and so forth. And they have King David and so forth. So we have the new covenant bringing us out of the slavery to sin and death into a place where now we have a new kingdom established, where we have a new authority, a new hierarchy. And, and we're sustained, we're created by water. We're sustained by the blood of the Eucharist. We're sustained by the prayers of being Mary and at the cross with Jesus. We're sustained by the liturgy, the, 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 by the scriptures that we, that we, that we pray daily. You know, so the Mass is the summation and the celebration outside of time and space of everything we believe. And that's why it so deliberately seems boring. Because at the cross, you would look at Jesus and say, this is a Roman execution, it's ghastly, and if I got no stake in this, I'm walking home because, you know, it's another day in Jerusalem for me. It's another Passover. Mm -hmm. But for those who have faith, now you look at the cross, if you're there, Mary or John, and that cross means a lot. Right? And so the mass looks boring, it's supposed to be. God keeps himself hidden because he wants to know who are my real disciples. I'll come in power, he said, I'll come later, and there'll be no mistaking who I am a second time. But right now, I want to know those who, even though it's inconvenient, there's other things they could be doing, they might even get mocked for doing it. In some parts of the world, you're murdered for doing it try to come together and celebrate that Eucharist and meet God present in this intersection of time and space right at this holy mass. At that moment, this hidden God, who deliberately keeps himself hidden in the form of bread and wine, he keeps himself hidden there because he wants to know from us, who am I and what, what will you give to me? Because you're, you're humble and broken, as am I. You break the bread. The priest of fractional promise breaks the bread in our brokenness. Or down. He's broken for us. We're broken. We're broken people. It's okay to be broken. Like Jerome realized, we got to give ourselves and our brokenness to God. That's what he wants. Because then he can work with the soul that's open. But the soul that's full of pride and doesn't need God, well, it rules in hell. Right? And I think we're going to uh, show you some mercy and uh, thank you once again and let you go home to your wife and family. Thank you. Thank you so much.